Hello and welcome back to the Audio Elgin Podcast. This is your host, Abigail Fritz, and today I'm speaking with Sandy Mercury about the history of the Elgin Depot Museum. Could you start by introducing yourself and telling me about your role in the Historical Association? My name is Sandy Murphy. Currently, I am in charge of the exhibits. I've been in charge of the exhibits since we opened in 2002. I've also served as secretary, vice president, and president throughout these years. I really wasn't involved in the founding of this association. Our first group of people that were working on the organization of the association, that all got started in 1988. I was just going to the meetings as a Elkanite, interested in what was going on. And one thing led to another, and people were bringing in wonderful artifacts and photos and old, old newspapers and things like that and said, can you keep them? We don't have any place for them. And we started, as a group, started talking about a museum. And that's where the idea got started. It was a long process. I think the real work toward a museum started in the mid-90s. It became a problem of finding where the museum would be. And so they kept looking around at different buildings on Main Street, around the corners. And at that time, this beautiful depot museum was sitting vacant. When the train stopped here in 1872, this was the beginning of our history. And so it was the perfect place for us to have our museum. After lots of discussions and lots of city council meetings, we started a fundraising plan. And finally, it came to, okay, let's write some grants. And several people wrote some very successful grants. One of them was Charlene Jordan. There was a lot of in-kind services counted toward the final tally. People came out of the woodwork to help clean, tear down, build up, whatever we could do to have it be counted in dollars and cents as in-kind services. It took a while, but we finally were able to have enough money to start the renovation, and it took probably close to two years. We were in amazingly good shape with this old building when we got started. Its previous life from way back, it was actually a depot. In later years, the city utilized it as a police station on one side and the health department on the other side. That was the best possible outcome for this building. They lowered the ceilings, they covered up the walls, and they didn't demolish any of the original woodwork. All the floors were the biggest problem. They were rotted, and they had to be dug out by hand. This particular floor plan or diagram for this building was a very common plan for depots in that day. Very simple. Two large rooms side by side with a ticket office in the middle. You have to remember this was 1903 and racism was uh, alive and well. And so when you walk into the museum today, the big room on the left was where our black neighbors waited for the train. And, and on the right side was where our white neighbors, they came through those doors. The room that is now the archives at that time was the baggage room. And this is where the porters carried bags to be carried out to the train. We finally opened the doors in 2002, and it was a joyous occasion, and none of us could believe that it had happened. A lot of people contributed to this wonderful project, and it was a pleasure being a part of all that. So the museum had been renovated and the doors were finally open. What happened next? Well, we were all beginners. We had all been in museums. That's what we used to say. Well, we know what a museum is supposed to look like. We had a few wonderful cases donated by some people in the community, but those are some big rooms. The front room included those large, beautiful displays hanging from the ceiling, and they were primarily funded by Rosalind Brinkley, who was a dedicated supporter of the Historical Association. I believe Charlene Jordan wrote the scripts on all of them, and the pictures are just fantastic. We are constantly trying to upgrade the museum's exhibits. Uh, we've recently done World War I. We've done a lot on World War II. We have a lot of memorabilia, uniforms, names, 
because of a wonderful board member we had. His name was Francis Smith, and he helped create the military room. And he and Ann Helgeson, who was our archivist, somehow managed to compile names and names and names. We have a lot of information there about everything that's military. Could you tell me about more of the museum's past exhibits? I think our first exhibits were on the African-American churches of Elgin. We've done fabulous exhibits on the 1940s of Elgin, the 1950s of Elgin. We did some railroad China exhibits. Some collectors contacted me and offered to bring over their collections, and they were just stunning. Nobody realized, certainly I didn't, that railroad supporters go along the sides of railroad tracks all over the country and pick up discarded China. What we were told is when the trains are going down the tracks and a plate breaks, they just throw it out the window. And so these shards, and some of them are quite large, became part of our exhibits, plus, of course, complete sets that these exhibitors had purchased. It was very interesting. If you could pick one last exhibit to tell people about, what would it be? I'd say about 10 years ago, my committee and I decided we were going to do Christmas trees, and it was really fun, and it was really well-received. It was also a lot of work because we were finding people who had special Christmas trees, like Charlie Brown, and we had penguins, and we had a tree that somebody had decorated with golfing things things like footballs and soccer balls and everything like that. It's amazing what people collect, and then they put them on a Christmas tree. We had a room full of trees, and it was quite beautiful. Sidna Arbuckle decided that we needed a tree for the museum, and we did. And she bought this beautiful tree, and a wonderful volunteer, Laverne Arbuckle, decided we needed to put some local mementos on our tree. And she made them, the little bricks and the little stuffed sausages. And then we went further than that, miniature corn pieces and cotton balls. And everybody worked together to make it what, you know, I like to call our Elgin tree. And we do change it out for some of the big holidays like uh, Hawkeye and Christmas. But we leave it up there all the time. And it's what made Elgin Elgin. This was rural until not that many years ago. We did have the brickyards. We had some people commuting to Austin, but this is farmland. And people identified with this and appreciated that this kind of thing was remembered for this area. And so we leave it up all the time. And so when we do school tours, particularly the kindergartners, the first graders, they love to sit and we talk about the tree. I'll say, does anybody ever get to see cotton? And I'll see some hand. Oh, yes, we have cotton down the down the road. It brings the children and the adults a reminder that this is our history. I'd like to thank Sandy for her great interview, and I'd like to invite all of our listeners to join us for the annual meeting of the Elgin Historical Association. You'll be able to hear about the making of this podcast and get to know our members, and you'll be able to enjoy some great refreshments while you do it. It will be held at 7 p.m. on October 21st at the Fleming Community Center, and I hope to see you there.